Okay. Um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for you know taking the time out and joining us here at the IOSG Metaverse Day Two. Uh, I'm Ashani, one of the associates at IOSG. Uh, shall we just take like a minute to uh, introduce everyone formally? Um, shall we start with you, Jess? Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Jess, and I'm the co-creator of Seed Club. Seed Club is a DAO that builds and invests in tokenized communities. Uh, we run cohort programs where we bring in some of the top thinkers that are pushing at the edge of the social token, community token, and DAO space and help them uh, launch and grow communities that own themselves. Um, so we, we're actually running our applications, I think are still open right now, assuming this is, in, is done before the 20th of December, we're recording on, on Tuesday. Um, and so if you're interested in launching a tokenized community, you should consider applying to the Seek Club fourth cohort. Thank you so much for that, Jess. Uh, Seed Club has some of the amazing um, kind of communities and DAOs that have that they've launched as well. Recently did their third cohort, and now, as Jess mentioned, they're doing the fourth cohort. Um, over to you, um, Connor from Gitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Connor Aday. I've uh, I work at Gitcoin. I've uh, been at Gitcoin for a few years now. I've been working in the Ethereum space for um, pretty much since 2015. Uh, but I, you know, I'm kind of a member of a few different DAOs. I, I like to try to participate where I can. Um, you know, my main my main role is with Gitcoin. Uh, I do a lot of our, you know, partnerships and and biz dev uh, work for our virtual events, hackathons, incubators, uh, grants rounds. Um, so so yeah, we've uh, we recently uh, kicked off the Gitcoin. We went from being you know private entity to now slowly transitioning into the DAO world. So. Um, it's definitely an exciting time and uh, happy to be here and talk about it. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I think everyone knows about Gitcoin, so I don't need to, you know, give an additional explanation there. Um, okay, over to you, Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin's from Uniquely slash Jenny Dow. Hey, Shani. So first of all, a very big thank you to IOSG. I think you guys are, are very supportive to entrepreneurs uh, and it's been a, a lot of fun uh, working with you guys. So Great. I'm the founder of Jenny Dao, and we set out to make the most decentralized Dao in the world. I think a lot of Dao's are decentralized in name only, and the assets end up being held centrally by by the uh, by the creator of the Dao. And, and this isn't really an ideal situation. My view of decentralization is that the founder should be able to get, hopefully doesn't, but should be able to get hit by a bus and the DAO should be able to continue functioning, owning the assets and even disposing the assets without the uh, the founder's presence. And this is what we aim to do with Jenny DAO. And when we set out to do it, we realized that there is no infrastructure to support this. So we built a whole uh, fractionalization platform called Uniquely, which allows people to take NFTs and creates a governance token, which both represents ownership in the NFTs themselves, but can also be the governance token, which controls the DAO. Uh, and this is uh, this is what we've done. We've got a nice collection of NFTs uh, and we've got the, uh, the largest uh, fractionalization platforms in terms of TVL. Yeah, you guys are doing some exciting stuff for Jenny DAO. And I think they've been acquiring some of the really fun assets. Like I've seen you guys, I think you, you got like a bunch of Cool cats a while back and um, a bunch of the other like collections as well. If you guys ever, if you're interested, go ahead and take a look at the Jenny Dow collection on Uniquely. Uh, maybe we can put in like a link to the um, to the vault in in one of our in one of our tweets or something like that, so so that people can go check it out. Um, and lastly, hi Stephen, nice to have you here as well with us. Uh, do you want to do a quick introduction, please? Thank you for having me here. Apologize, I got the wrong link. Um, I'm the founder of UTU DAO One. It's a platform to allow anyone to create their DAO. Our vision is try to bring the barrier for average people to go into a DAO to benefit from blockchain technology. For the past four or five years, we've been trying to build DAO, but the key problem is um, the technology barrier for average people to understand what blockchain is, to use external wallet, to sign transactions, paying a higher transaction fee. So we're trying to solve that problem over the years. And now we have built this mobile app, um, be able to allow anyone who can use Facebook or Instagram, social media platform to be able to, to create their own DAO and DAO token and to provide entire governance tool for them run 
um, their private DAO however they want it. So yeah, we have just launched our beta version since July this year. Now the 2.0 version is due to launch uh, around Christmas time. So feel free to uh, jump in and experiment. It's absolutely free. Okay, Thanks. thank you so much. Um, so guys, let's just move forward. And I think one of the first things I would like to all ask you guys about is, you know, besides the DAO you guys are creating yourself, uh, who do you consider to be like some of the most successful DAOs? And maybe you can give like a one or two liner on why you think that is. Uh, open open question to the panel. That's an interesting question, I think, because the, you know, the definition of, of success is like, is different for everyone, but also like the definition of a DAO is not entirely clear to me. Like in, in, in my opinion, like the Bitcoin network was like one of the first DAOs, right? Like, yeah, it's obviously not a DAO as we see it today with, you know, like, uh, you know, tally governance voting and all of that, but like, it's a collection of, of individuals that are trying to, you know, govern and upgrade a network um, uh, together. And, you know, even, even Ethereum as a whole could be seen as a DAO in a lot of ways. Um, so that doesn't really answer the question, but I guess in, in terms of what I think we're thinking about what DAOs are, you know, today, like, um, I don't even, it's a tough question. I don't know. Like there's social DAOs, you know, there's yeah. NFT DAOs. Uh, I guess I, I'm curious what the rest of you think would you consider the most successful? Uh, can I jump in here? I really think US IO or US has been a successful DAO. I've been involved in the US uh, start from the development. I was the core arbitrator of the uh, US arbitration forum. And I'm seeing this community has been growing. Now we have about 2 million token holders who's um, staking 95% of their token to the network. And also, I'm, I'm sure you all heard the news that the community has kicked out the original founding company, Block One, out of the network uh, because they feel like the company not doing much for the community. So I'm saying it's, it's really essential. And the software itself is really capable of building a DAO as we are using US uh, as the underlying blockchain. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Jazz Benjamin, maybe you guys can also answer the question and, you know, just chime in, like, what do you think are, could be in your minds, like some successful metrics, right, for, for a good DAO? So the, the easiest uh, uh, metrics, obviously, price performance. And I think in this case, you've had a constitution DAO and uh, you've had uh, you've had the, the, the pleaser DAO uh, with their, with their Doge NFT, which, which have uh, uh, attracted big communities have had a very positive uh, price performance. And that's definitely the, the easiest to, to measure metric. Um, but that doesn't mean they're perfect. And I think every DAO has some kind of flaw and it's usually trying to balance uh, different, uh, different aspects. Um, I think uh, efficiency of, of, uh, of execution versus true decentralization and, and governance goals sometimes uh, are, are conf conflict with each other. And if you look at what happened with Constitution DAO, they, I think it was a really good project, but they failed to buy the Constitution. They closed down the project, returned the money to investors, and then the token shot up by 6x and went up to like $1.5 billion. So whether that's a successful DAO, it's a successful token. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a, it's a successful DAO though, when, it, when it's a, a DAO that's, that's a void of a mission and any and assets. Uh, we saw the, the Doge NFT, which rose to $300 million, um, which was just fantastic. I think it, it, it really brought a lot of attention to the whole fractionalization space and has been a a net positive to the industry, but nobody in the world would actually hope to acquire an NFT for three hundred million dollars. Uh, and so, from that point of view, I think that the that the the measure of um, of, of success, I think, um, has has different aspects. Or um, I think where where Jenny Dow has really excelled in um, in it has really excelled so far has been in tr in creating a true decentralization framework. Uh, where where there's very few DAOs out there that really allow people to to give true ownership to the individual token holders, um, 
and we've acquired a, a beautiful collection of NFTs. Uh, but there's still a, a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, I think that we're, we, we've got still a lot of work to, to integrate with guilds. I think that's gonna be a big theme for 2022. Um, if we saw that, that DeFi was the big theme of 2020, NFTs was the big theme of 2021, I've got a feeling that DAOs are going to be the big the big theme of 2022, and we've still got a lot to explore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and like I think you you brought up like the point of decentralization, right? Um, and like very very curious on that. So, how do you call a DAO decentralized, and at and to what certain what extent should it be decentralized, right? Um, you know you still need a leadership, you still need the core community to be contributing and to be driving the project forward. But at the same time, you wanna make sure that there's no single point of failure. So um, in, in your minds, like, and your experiences as well, running DAOs, how, how do you think those who are trying to build new DAOs should kind of balance this, uh, you know, very tricky um, slope? I think it's extremely important and it really goes beyond just uh, the issue of a single point of failure. I think that when we've got DAOs, we've basically got investment vehicles. And the investment vehicles should not be run by a fund manager or else you just invest in a fund. To be a DAO, you need to be decentralized and the token holders need to be in direct control, not just of the decisions, but even of the assets themselves. And there's a very good tooling uh, that, that's being developed for, for managing things like decisions, you know, there's snapshot, there's these kind of things, but just presenting, uh, decisions in front of your community and ask them to vote on this is not enough. I think it really takes, need to be a uh, go, go step beyond that, where the, the DAO members need to be control of the assets, both in terms of acquisitions, but even in terms of disposals, when they dispose the assets it needs to be their decision and they need to be able to receive the proceeds from those, from those, uh, disposals. Um, so this is the, the the vision that I have, and I think that we're in a fortunate situation in that NFTs are on chain, and this type of true on chain governance is possible. Uh, but now that you've got DAOs talking about buying basketball teams and mm -hmm. and physical assets, uh, I mean, there's there's a, a DAO that wants to buy the whole world, like that's the mission. They want to buy up all the real estate in the world. Uh, Which DAO is this? I can't remember. I just saw the idea. That was it, <laughs> okay. it was hilarious. Um, but the, these kind of things are probably going to become a lot more difficult. Uh, but I think we're, we're starting, uh, we're starting with one mission. It's just to give true decentralized ownership of NFTs. So I, I absolutely agree with all your points on like decentralization of, of DAOs and how that's important. I would push back a bit on like the, the main metric of success being the token price or that like, you know, all, all DAOs need to be asset managers of some kind, like they're. I think there could be some incredibly successful DAOs, you know, with lots of token holders, active governance, or at least they're delegating and like they're, you know, involved. Um, but the token price doesn't necessarily need to be going up, up and up. Like it's not all about speculation. Um, and then, you know, you have like social DAOs and like, you know, bankless DAO and friends with benefits. And even though maybe the tokens have been going up, like I don't necessarily think that they they need to be going up for it to be successful. Like it's, it's, I think what's more important is, is actually the user engagement and um, just, you know, what the DAO is producing or, you know, if they're building something. And I mean, some of like, like I, I'd say, I think MakerDAO is an interesting um, uh, one to talk about here because they were a pretty early project. And I think they've, they've built an incredible um, just product like, like die multi-collateral die. Um, has kind of stood the test of time. Um, I don't, the DAO is extremely, you know, efficient in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, obviously the, the token hasn't necessarily mooned, but, um, you know, it's an example of like a, a super interesting project, I think that um, has gotten a lot of engagement, but, um, you know, it's not all about number go up, I guess. I'd also like to give another angle on the decentralization of the DAO. I mean, you know, I totally agree. Uh, decentralization is extremely important to give ownership back to the, uh, the the users. And at the same time, I'm looking at DAO from a more broader spectrum, not only investment, but also there can be so many types of DAOs. Even a group of students can be a DAO. They can use their token just to vote who's the best student uh, of the month. So um, 
to what degree, I think we need not only need to consider the centralization, but also the usability, right? Um, and also the efficiency, the cost efficiency. I think a lot of us, especially me, like I started from 2016, started about DAO experimenting. A lot of, a lot of us are very, um, how to say, um, <clears throat> <laughs> your vision is it's perfect down perfect decentralization but sometimes we just need to have some room for semi decentralizing decentralization for different types of doubt there are just so many different types of doubt require different level of decentralization mm, yeah and yeah. and i think like to do i think what benjamin was also trying to allude to if i'm not wrong uh was the fact that there are certain DAOs that people enter into, like patron DAO, patronage DAOs, for example, where the goal is to make investments, right? So the ROR essentially is what people are trying to buy into in the first place. But of course, for make a DAO and uh, operational DAOs where you have, you know, very like you have products, you have intentional products, I guess, in those cases, um, that becomes less sensitive. Uh, like the price is not that much of a like, value accrual process. Um, Jess, uh, thanks for, you had some technical issues. Thanks for joining us back in. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts as well. Can you repeat the question? I think I missed the question or I can no pick worries. it up from what I hear you guys talking about here. But... Yeah, I mean, I think it's a mishmash. We started off talking about, you know, the success metrics for a DAO okay. and the second thing being decentralization versus, you know, single point of entry and leadership driving awesome. the DAO. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny. We're talking about DAOs. Um, as if there's some monolithic thing, and, and really this is like a you know going to be looked at like a, a corporation or a limited liability company. It's sort of the the internet's version of that. So, like, what is a successful company? Well, or, or organization in, in in the IRL space, like there are a number of metrics, and those should be driven by the uh, objectives of of the organization. So, I think there's a lot of people talking about metrics right now for DAOs. You know, definitely price is one of them. Definitely engagement is one of them. But I don't think any of those are are ultimately important unless you know what you're trying to, to move towards. And that's gonna be DAO specific and, and timing specific for those organizations. Um, as far as decentralization goes, I, I think we got hung up and tried to be too perfect and ideological for a number of years. And we've seen a huge growth in DAOs because uh, we've taken a pragmatic approach generally. Um, that's usually involved there being signers on a multi-sig and some sort of um, composable tool set that teams are using to go build things, um, snapshot, uh, a safe or a multi-sig, um, you know, just a token distribution being kind of like the, the underlying tools that many of these, these projects are using. And I think that's been great. Like there's an, no shortage of things for us to try to figure out. Um, definitely the goal needs to be pushing towards a, a broader, um, more decentralized, you know, true decentralized entity. Um, but the reality is the tech's not there. It's not user-friendly right now. And we're better off experimenting and pushing forward right now, absent that perfection, uh, to learn how to better organize and, and get more people into the space. And I think that's broadly what's happening right now. So uh, it's all like a, a spectrum. And I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, for everyone, for sharing about that. Um, I guess, I guess kind of moving a little bit in the direction, like diving a little bit deeper into DAOs and like the operational part of it. Um, one key question is how do you, how do you incentivize your core community or your core contributors? Uh, how do you identify them in the first place? And then how do you make sure to incentivize them? Um, open-ended question again. So I think yeah, this I mean is yeah, go ahead, Connor. No, you go, man. You go. Um, well, I was just gonna say, I, like again, like you know, there's there's many different you know like approaches to DAOs and types of DAOs, but like the like the the two main ways I'm kind of thinking about these things right now is like there there are DAOs that are just launching from nothing, like they're going fully decentralized, launching a DAO, rallying behind some you know some motive to buy a constitution or to fractionalize you know this or you know govern that, and then we have uh, projects who, you know, already exist, like they might, they might just be protocol, they might be a private entity that are now kind of moving to decentralize what they already have, and they may have already built up a community. Um, and it, it's almost approaching from like the opposite side, like, you know, for example, um, like ENS, um, you know, is kind of like a core pillar in the Ethereum space at this point. Um, and they just launched, you know, their token and their DAO and they're, you know, moving over the keys to the multi-sig and um, kind of progressively decentralizing from there. Um, and they already have a huge, huge community. And, you know, same thing like Shapeshift, I think is a really interesting one too, because 
you know, they've been around for so long. It's been, you know, it, uh, it was kind of a centralized exchange, then it was a decentralized exchange, but they were still doing KYC, it was still a private company. And they just kind of, you know, ripped the bandaid off and said, we're going full DAO, you know, no more company, like decentralize everything, um, which is, which has been really, really interesting to see. And then Gitcoin is kind of in a similar boat where, you know, we built up like uh, a, a pretty strong community of blockchain developers, um, of, you know, Ethereum grantees, projects. Um, and now we're moving to kind of, you know, decentralize a lot of, a lot of our products, um, which, you know, isn't there yet, which maybe we'll touch upon in, in a bit, but, um, but we have DAOs that are kind of coming out of pre-existing communities. And, and in that case, like, you know, you already have people that are, you know, part of the project or want to contribute and want to join. And then we have DAOs that are, you know, kind of being created out of, out of uh, you know, nothing, which is potentially even cooler if they can actually rally people around a cause. Um, but again, yeah, you know, it's all, always about incentives. Like people, people want to contribute um, and help, but you know, people's time is valuable. And um, I, I find it really interesting, you know, the people that are like working for like four different DAOs and like have all these income streams and are able to contribute to so many different things. Like, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if I could do that. Like, you know, I feel like I need to stay focused. But, um, but yeah, it's all about coordination and incentives at the end of the day. Yeah, I have a, a couple of sort of, I guess, thoughts on this. One, I think, you know, one of the things that has allowed so many of these DAOs to succeed right now is that they've uh, really been incentivizing on a macro level than on a micro level. So for a long time, I think we were focused on mechanism design that was trying to drive forward certain types of content creation or, uh, you know, uh, more microeconomic design within DAOs. I think that's very challenging and really we haven't seen a whole lot of progress there, but where we have seen progress is in sort of aligning incentives at the governance level or the meta level. So uh, DAO governance tokens as being the thing that people earn or at least get exposure to for the, for their contributions. Um, so I think that's a, a, a big thing that has led to a lot of progress uh, Two, I think there's two distinct groups of contributors to most projects. Um, you, uh, and I, I think it's uh, the barbell is the right way to think of this on, on one side, there's usually a small core team or group that kind of acts like a core team that creates um, probably a significant amount of value per capita, but um, uh, is small in number. And I think on the other side, you have a much larger crowd that's probably individually creating a smaller amount of value, but on aggregate creates a, a significant amount of value. And I, th I think this is across the board, whether it's come from a, a company or, or and, and decentralized or it's sort of emerged from a discord. There's usually a small number of people that have the information and uh, are putting their time and effort into it full time. And, and I think for, for teams and, and DAOs to be successful, we need to recognize that that, that type of commitment and, and um, responsibility taking is, is, is kind of key, uh, but also it doesn't work unless we, we can't get the full value out of these communities unless there is a clear pathway for those broader members to contribute. And so I think, you know, on one side, it looks a lot like, you know, having a, a regular stipend or reward or grant or, or, um, or salary. And on the other side, it looks like bounties or coordinate circles or some mixture of the two. And my expectation is we'll see a lot more innovation in the compensation and, and reward models because we've kind of put that to the side to a degree and saying, well, we don't exactly know how to do this properly. So we're going to figure that out, but we'll all be aligned on this big adventure by holding uh, DAO governance tokens and, and we can figure out the rest later. And I think now is later. Yeah, uh, just real quick on that note, I, I, I saw something from Forefront the other day um, where like, you know, if you're working for the DAO, if you, and I just pulled it up, if you're there for, you know, two years full time, you're eligible for an exchange program with other DAOs, three years full time, you can take like a six month paid sabbatical, like they're giving health insurance stipends and travel funds and, you know, like th th they're providing real actual, like what are, what would be employment benefits, Um to DAO contributors, which, you know, we haven't really seen a lot of DAOs do. And then there's also kind of like the legal and liability aspect that is a whole nother beast that will be tackled sometime in the future. But, um, but yeah, some people want what looks like a full-time employment. Some people want to be contracting with a bunch of different projects. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to approach it. I think if you've got a true ideolo ideological message, you will find people who will be ideologically driven and just volunteer the time. And these are the best members because they, you know, they're the most passionate, they really believe in the vision and they're, they're, they're the most uh, sweat and tears into making the, the DAO successful. But those people are the minority and you're, you're, you can get a, a small uh, group of hardcore contributors uh, from that, but you're not going to get a mass market. 
and people are you know show me the uh, show me the, the the incentive I'll show you the result and people are economically uh, incentivized most of the time uh, at the beginning with with Jenny Dow, we had this kind of free for all system where anybody could put up proposals, anybody could vote. And it worked when we were small and very quickly became chaotic. Uh, there started being moments where we had three proposals within a two day period uh, with no respect to, to the timing of announcements or, or budgetary restraints for, from, uh, from our treasury. Uh, and that clearly wasn't working anymore. So we moved over uh, the, the community uh, self wrote uh, on their own initiative, a constitution and created uh, council member roles. Uh, there's six council members who get paid. At the beginning, I didn't expect them to put that much work. So they were getting uh, very small salaries. And then all of a sudden I realized that these guys were super passionate and putting tons of work into it and were working like full-time employees. Um, and so we decided to, we voted to, to quintuple their, their, their salary and that's been working very well so far. Yeah. Yeah. At, at Gitcoin, we're also like looking into, you know, how we can compensate stewards who aren't necessarily working full time, but they are spending their time, you know, reading governance proposals and, and voting and, you know, they're representing the people that delegate to them. Um, but if you're going to start compensating, then, you know, we're thinking about how can we have like steward report cards and, um, you know, way, ways to judge their engagement and, and make sure that, you know, people who are want to get more engaged are, are properly compensated. Um, so it's a hard problem to solve. So Cods and Chain is taking a, a pretty good, good approach. So they're moving over to the DAO model and you can stake your token, but you only receive staking rewards if you vote on proposals. So uh, could you repeat the name again? Gods Unchained, the card game. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Gods Unchained. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's going to be interesting because all of a sudden you just owning the token staking is not good enough. You actually really need to be actively involved in, in governance. Um, and that voting could really... is, voting is not active involvement in governance though, right? That's like paying somebody to go vote in, a, in an election. It's really going to get people to participate, but I, I don't know if that's like the smart, I, I just think it's like, yeah, great, great experiment, but there's, there's no easy solution here to get people, you know, deeply involved in caring about the discussion part of that proposal, which is I think more important than the actual voting. That's true. I forget who did this, but recently I saw someone made a governance proposal that was like, if you are a human, do not vote on this. And then it got a bunch of votes from, you know, seemingly <laughs> bots. <laughs> I would have voted yes, though. <laughs> um, I'd like to jump in here. We talk a lot about the incentives, the governance. Um, you know, ben talk about um, the proposal system. And I think essentially what we really have to touch on is uh, we're, we're like, this is DAO panel. What we were talking about is absolutely nonsense to average people. Like uh, we talk about to let everyone to vote a proposal, but essentially 95% 95, 95 of the population can't get into the blockchain, can't get into DAO. Even they're passionate about it because they can't, they don't understand how to manage the private key. They don't understand how to use a wallet, sign the transactions, staking the tokens. All of those just made it impossible. Like, you know, we all founders of DAOs, but really the key question is not to experiment what's the incentive or the government's model, but really bring the mass into the DAO, make them understand how easy to use, how to benefit from them. That is really the key. Um, you know, we talk about institution DAO, what happened? The real, real failure is this DAO, great initiative, but it just can't bring the people who have passion about really into this DAO. There are 95% of people passionate about buying the constitution, but they just can't get into it. It's just too hard to use. That is the key. If we really want to move forward to the future to really bring the mass, as CZ said, there are only 5% of the population now into the crypto. It's not because we're not good enough or the incentive not good enough. It's because the technology is too hot. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I buy that, frankly. I think like there is, without a doubt, there's UX uh, challenges with it. Um, but I think it's more um, education and understanding. And I think that's actually probably the, the solution is more social than it is technological. I, I think unfortunately, so many of the, like the, the ways that we can solve UX challenges right now are actually watering down the fundamental value of 
of crypto and of Web3 and of DAOs, which is the, the ownership of these digital assets and an ownership stake in networks. And you know, it, uh, most of the solutions right now, at least, and I think for the foreseeable future, are going to push that friction or, or benefit off uh, to, to some other part of the value chain. So whether that's, you know, self you know, wallets, you know, in, in app wallets, et cetera. Uh, but what I think is like the most um, exciting part is like, just look at the number of learning communities that are exploding across Web3 right now. And, you know, the thing that we all have on this panel, and I, I think uh, probably many people listening have is, is some semblance of a sense-making network that helps them make sense of what is a fast-paced, ever-evolving, really weird space. And, you know, to, to be able to take action in a space, I think, uh, requires us to have a network of others that we can actually engage with, that we have peers that can support us. Like, where's customer service in Web3? Well, it probably will live in, in a DAO of some sort. Um, so, yes, I think there's... Um, you know, without a doubt, acknowledge there's a UX challenge. I think it's more of an education challenge. And I also think that, you know, I, I don't think any of our DAOs would benefit from a million new users coming into it today. So I, I don't think volume of participants is, is the challenge. I think it's, um, you know, competent understanding, you know, uh, high value contributors that are ultimately the, the, the scarce resource right now. Of course, if we look at something like Constitution DAO or, or those that are more coming together to, to buy something or, or aiming after that mainstream, yes, without a doubt, like the gas fees, and that was unfortunate for, for a number of people. Um, but I do think that's going to be in, in, in the minority in the large part, at least in the short term. Um, and that, yeah, we, should, we I think designing for the masses right now might actually be a, a bit of a mistake. Yeah. And I guess on that point, like I, I would say that the, the user experience is is way better than it was one, two, three years ago. Like we, we've came a very long way. Um, there's still, you know, it's still difficult for someone new to, you know, set up a MetaMask, secure their keys, um, you know, but like, I don't know, like I feel like Snapshot, Tally, like a lot of the DAO tooling is, is really has came a long way. And like the way I see this going mainstream isn't necessarily like, you know, a million people in a discord, like, um, you know, actively voting, like the reality is most people don't actively participate or vote, like, like delegation is going to be key, but making sure it, people still care who they delegate to. But like, you know, like any online community can be a DAO, like think of any subreddit community or gaming community, like, or like, you know, Costco memberships could be a DAO one day. And every time you earn Costco points, like there, there there's a lot there's a lot of ways it can go more mainstream, I think, without everyone having to get in, in the weeds of like the technicalities of it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Like, Benjamin, do you have... We were sort of like directors of companies and trying to educate all the employees how company runs, what's the inside, how companies structure. I mean, majority of the population doesn't need the education. They need to join the DAO and benefit from them. Like they join the internet, benefit from the internet, but they don't need to understand internet. That's what I'm saying. Uh, like we, we have to solve the um, mass adoption issue to, to really bring down to mainstream. Holding tokens though, right? Like if, if you're launching a consumer application and exiting to community and I mean, you know, there's a, an airdrop. So ENS maybe is like a, maybe not an example oh. for a good broad market one, but you know, like all of a sudden, you, you, you know, my girlfriend got a, a an airdrop of tokens and is now you know in crypto because of that airdrop of tokens that for an ENS that I set up for her. Um, you know she's she's technically a member of, of that DAO, probably not going to be voting. She delegated her votes you know to somebody else. I think that is you know an example of, of mainstream adoption to a degree. I think you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't think everybody needs to vote, but but yeah, I mean the at the edges like maybe five people coming together to buy NFTs or play some some games together is actually an interesting use case where, where I, I would agree with you that the we, user experience is maybe the big barrier. We, we talk a lot about cryptocurrency, NFTs, and DAO Ethereum. I mean, this, like, we are so in the box. Like, there are a, a broader spectrum of DAOs, like what I'm talking about. In each of the class can be a DAO. Each of the small community, local community can be a DAO. Uh, NGOs, we are transforming lots of NGOs, becoming DAOs, uh, retail brands. I mean, there's just so much. And most of the majority of the people, they don't need to understand it. They just need to simply use it and benefit from them. I mean, I guess like like a way to look at it is like DAO can either be, you know, companies and your LLCs, or it can replace your Discord communities, your Telegram groups, your... That's the mistake. Uh, 
like yeah, sorry. I, I'm assuming is that what you're saying? Like you can have two of these like different types of communities and DAOs. Yeah, that's the mistake I've made for the past five years, trying to educate an employee about what company is, trying to make everyone understand and participate, become an owner of a company. I mean, yeah, there, there are people enthusiastic and passionate about it, but there are also people who just want to benefit. Uh, majority, 95% of the population, that we, mm. we, we're not supposed to educate them, but instead just bring them naturally. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, your your homeowners association or neighborhood watch could be a DAO. Um, you know, your small local grocery store, your communities. Um, and, and I just mentioned this, but I'm I'm really excited. Apparently, you know, Reddit is going to be tokenizing all their subreddits, and you know, I, like who I who I don't even know what's happening with that and what layer two they're using or what the plan is. But like things like that, like you see a mainstream you know company that has these huge internet communities that probably have never touched blockchain. All of a sudden, there's there's some tokens, some incentives. It, it it could mess things up, but it'll be really interesting to see. Like exactly. how, that is the future of DAO. That is the future of DAO. Is crypto community is a very tiny, small portion of DAO. Yeah, but I, also like DAOs aren't going to solve everything. Like I think, especially like the sushi swap drama as of late, as you guys have probably seen, and it's been you know interesting to follow along. Like coordination is hard, and making things fully decentralized is is difficult, and like. There are cases where it probably makes sense that this is a you know a private company or some you know a, an actual legal entity or you know there's some hierarchy to it, um, uh, but you know it's all we're all experimenting so it's fun but there, there, there's definitely a balance and like there's going to be DAOs that don't succeed um, you know if there's a bear market like we're going to see what projects people really care about and continue to contribute to and which ones kind of fade away so. Hmm. Um, I, I guess we've, we've been talking about this for a while now, so just to move the panel forward, um, I guess one of the questions, so I asked my friends yesterday, what do you guys, what, I'm doing this, uh, moderating this panel tomorrow, is there any particular question, right? Uh, all of these guys that are attending are DAO experts themselves. Uh, what would you like to ask them? And I think one question that's really struck with me was, uh, the person asked, how, how, how is, like, when you're thinking about DAO, how is it different from you know like a publicly listed company where the common shareholders also have uh, a voting right right like how's the difference and i feel like there's a lot to unpack with this question and this is uh, I'm, I'm just going to give this like throw this question at you guys i think we're, we're going to have like interesting uh, comments on this one um yeah, yeah right. whoever wants to take it I'd first just say, I, I wouldn't claim myself to be a DAO expert. I, I don't think there's many DAO <laughs> experts out there. I think everyone's kind of just figuring it, figuring it out as they go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's tough. Like that's kind of what companies are. They're shareholders who technically can vote on, you know, like big decisions and the board and management. But like most people who are buying stocks aren't voting on these things. Yeah. But like people think of DAOs as companies and that's that's where you get into like at least in the US like kind of if the you know securities law territory um where you know you're not buying ownership in any entity like if it's just a governance token you know you don't you don't own part of that company you don't have any claim on the assets like it's it's a much different structure and that i mean i'm sure there there's going to be more you know like sec you know like lawsuits and and all of that in the future for for DAOs that look a lot more like private companies um but but the, the liability aspect is also um an important one like if a DAO does something bad or breaks the law like there is you know there must there's some leader of the DAO, or if not like is everybody liable like they're, they're you know and there's been conversations on this like do we crowdfund, you know, like uh, a treasury for like legal protection if, you know, bad things happen and there's, there's not really a hard answer or a good answer to it yet. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's all, it's all an experiment. I keep saying that, but I really believe it. Yeah, Benjamin. I think, um, yeah, if you, it's so DAOs and companies should be very different. They're not always very different, but they should be very different. Uh, and that DAOs really should start with the word de decentralization. Um, when when the Constitution DAO uh, auction went to went to Sotheby's and auctioned for the for the Constitution, uh, Sotheby's ran into a problem in that they had to KYC 
all 2,000 members of the DAO, which was impossible. So they ended up came person who acted as a representative of the DAO. And all of a sudden, you get a very centralized uh, process. Um, but it's not just typical to, to Constitution DAO. I think they're taking a pragmatic approach, which a lot of other people are taking. And when you've got DAOs buying unreleased versions of Wu-Tang Clan CD, where's that CD going to sit? Is it going to be in somebody's, even if it's a nice box, will it sit in somebody's living room? And if the physical asset is inside somebody's living room, all of a sudden you're extremely centralized. Uh, and this, to, in my opinion, starts resembling a lot what a, what a, uh, a company would look like. Um, so, so it's it's really crucial for for not just decisions to be voted, but actual real asset ownership to be controlled by the DAO members. Um, and this is a, this is a point that I stress over and over again. And when you've guaranteed that, then you have achieved true decentralization, and you are very different from what a company is. So you don't, you know, if you own a stock in a company, you you have some kind of legal entitlement over the assets of the company, but the assets of the company don't hold, are not in your wallet. They're controlled by somebody else who's supposed to act on your behalf. Um, and in order to avoid becoming a collective investment scheme, I think this, uh, this distinction is very important. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree. Um, I'd like to give some of my two cents. Um, so there are similarities and differences. So I see company and DAO, um, essentially the ownership, uh, a public company is owned by shareholders and DAO is owned by token holders. But essentially what you translate, give a real world example is Facebook is owned by shareholders. Uh, in Web3, in DAO, that Facebook platform is supposed to be owned by all of its users, 28 um, 2.8 billion users. And all of the users should have a right to say, what's the rules of the platform? What content is supposed to be allowed? But now it's centralized. It's all decided by the operator, Facebook. But I'm seeing in the DAO, these, uh, all the rules of the platforms could be owned and decided by all of its users. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and I, the person I'm seeing in DAO is the upgrade of company. And there are similarities, and, but there's difference. Uh, one important aspect is the efficiency. If I build a DAO, I can easily, uh, not easily, but I can uh, issue token uh, overnight become a multi-million dollar DAO uh, where a company to you know, start from scratch, register the company, form a shareholder, and go through all the centralized entities to enforce all the uh, actions. But now on the DAO, it's executed by code. So it's more, much more efficient and uh, less cost. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Benjamin's really onto something here. I think there's a, a real challenge that comes when you have a DAO that doesn't own the assets, um, or at least token holders don't have sort of custody of that assets. And, you know, I think the pragmatic approach is, is that there might be multi six signers in the middle of there, but ultimately we should be trying to get to a place where, you know, token holders have a say and, and they they have the sort of ultimate custody or control over these assets, and which means that doing anything in the real world right now is is challenging to, to say the least. And so I think the Constitution DAO is a, an example of that, whereas, you know, buying NFTs and fractionalizing NFTs is, is maybe the, the exact opposite end of that. Um, so I, th I think that that's the, the, you know, the main difference is we're running organizations that are, uh, as DAOs are governed by smart contracts and companies are governed by legal contracts. And without a, you know, there's a lot of crossover happening right now with legal wrap DAOs or, or um, you know, I, uh, limited liability companies that have DAO governance voting. And I think those are all interesting, but truly the, the strong tech version of this is we are building, you know, digital organizations owned by individuals who have digital ownership represented through tokens uh, in, in networks and not firms. And I don't think we've fully seen, you know, we're still so new and, and you know, I think Connor's right. This is still all very much an experiment, but like, what do when we're part of this multi-decade transfer from the firm being the way that we coordinate work to and economic activity to the network being the way we coordinate work and economic activity. In the last 20 years of the internet, I think we'll just be seen as like the very early stages of that. Uh, and the next 20 years will be us figuring out how to actually truly have ownership and say in these networks, which I think is essential for us to, you know, have, have a, a 
you know, effective way for a human beings to still be in the, the technology loop moving forward. Yeah. Oh, well, everyone, thank you so much for your time. I think this is all we have for today.